Sonic Origins was released on Sonic's birthday in 2022. A collection of his first four mainline adventures, using the remastered versions that were mostly exclusive to mobile phones beforehand. As well as a brand new remaster for Sonic 3 and Knuckles, made specifically for this collection. There were plenty of changes made to each game to set them apart from their original releases, which I was sure to detail in this video here. But there is still room for improvement, and so Sonic Origins Plus is released one year later as both an update and a physical retail game. And here is that physical release. Just like with Mania Plus, one of the biggest selling points of this edition is getting to finally own the game in a physical form. And as you can see here, I've got the case open to reveal the default cover. That is because it comes with a cooler reverse cover, just like with Mania. But where Mania released with the second edition Genesis box art, Origins Plus as the classic first edition. Now, please excuse the wear and tear on the Sonic 1 case. It's the very same one we had from when I was a kid. But it has a grid background where Origins has a checkerboard, but they're black backgrounds all the same. You've got the picture on picture for the illustration, title, seal of quality, and Genesis logo. The only thing missing is a giant not for resale sticker, which I think would be a funny addition, but that would of course cover Tails' head and we wouldn't want that. But there is a cool reference in the Origins image. Sonic holds the Genesis for his debut. Amy has what I assume is a copy of Sonic CD for her debut. Knuckles has a lock on cartridge for his debut. And Tails holds a Game Gear, and if you look closely, it's the 8-bit version of Sonic 2, which is technically his debut since that game ended up releasing first, but his design is of course based on the actual Sonic 2 16-bit. Turning it over to the back, we have the same orange checkerboards for the game's info. This 1-2 to two players you of course won't find on the Sonic 1 case, because He's the only character, but if we look at Kid Chameleon, we'll see that same icon, so it's cool they used the real symbol. And I like how it says Genesis does, though it is ironic since this is on a Nintendo console. But these numbers below the barcode are actually two references. The first set you may recognize as the level select code for Sonic 2. It's also Yuji Naka's birthday. And the second set is the code for turning into Super Sonic in Sonic 2, and that same code is used throughout Origins. But besides the case, Plus also came with an art book, just like Mania. A lot of this you'll find in the museum, but this page shows us the cover variants according to region. So of course here we have the Genesis cover I just showed for the US release, but if you bought the game in Europe, it would be this cover here, and if you bought the game in Japan, you would have this one. These all refer to that region's cover of Sonic 1, so you have the Genesis Sonic 1, the Mega Drive cover in Europe, and the Mega Drive cover in Japan. But with all of that aside, it is nice to now have Sonic Origins, as well as Origins Plus, on a physical cartridge. Wait. What's that? Oh, right. Despite the title, Origins Plus isn't actually on the card, instead coming in the form of a download code, which is a bit of a bummer. If you buy the game used, you're not getting Plus with it. When the eShop closes down, the new features won't be available, and it does away with the neat quirk that came with Mania Plus, where if you owned the game already, it's the base game without the card. Put the card in, and it suddenly becomes the plus version. Which I realize it works better the way Origins does it, because I'll have the plus features no matter what game I have inserted, but it also makes this card completely obsolete to me. But then again, that's just the nature of collecting games in the modern age, so 
it is what it is. Anyway, let's pop this cartridge in and see what's on it. Then we'll carry on to do the actual review. So on the cart, we have Sonic Origins version 1.5. So the Hidden Palace skip glitch and debug mode coin trick will be patched out from the get-go. But also, many of the bad bugs will be gone too, so no having to hear Tails jumping around off-screen. Letting the game update, we'll have version 2.0 that's released to coincide with the plus add-on. So let's check out any changes implemented before even adding on the plus features. The first difference is in the Sonic Team logo. The original was static, but now we'll have the version you'll recognize from Sonic Frontiers. Pressing X on the title screen used to simply bring up this prompt with a QR code, which is pretty silly considering we're already on a digital device. But now in the new version, we'll have an actual manual we can look through. You'll notice it says Origins Plus at the top, and yes, it covers all the plus additions. Guess there's no point in making two separate manuals to display, depending on if you bought the DLC or not. There's a lot of good info in here, and it's laid out nicely with a table of contents. My only real gripe is if you're flipping through page to page, your selection resets after each page turn. At least it has touchscreen controls. Our first major change can be seen as Sonic if we jump into Sonic 1. And as you can see, our drop dash has been updated. Well, sort of. When Origins was first released, the drop dash was implemented into each of the four classic games. And there was a lot of complaints on how it wasn't handled exactly the same as in Mania. Though I think that comes with a bit of a misunderstanding of what specifically the drop dash entails. The spin dash consists of two parts, the spin and the dash. The momentum is charged in the spin, so you can then dash off. The drop dash in turn also consists of two parts, the drop and the dash. And here, the momentum is charged during the drop. There is nothing about the drop dash that would imply you're meant to be able to switch directions when using it. Instead, that just comes down to how Sonic Mania as a whole is controlled. See, you can turn around in the air at any point in Sonic Mania, whether it's a stationary jump, a basic roll, a spin dash roll, or a drop dash roll. But that was never the case for Sonic 1 or Sonic 2. Rolling in Sonic 1 was strictly one direction. And it's the same for Sonic 2, even with the inclusion of the spin dash. Sonic 3 had this as well, but the difference is the insta-shield interrupted this roll lock. Which is why you could use the insta-shield in Origin Sonic 1 and 2 to drop dash in both directions. Though the Sonic 3 remaster removes this roll lock out of the gate, even in the base version of Sonic Origins. That leaves us with Sonic CD being the only game of the four that had no roll locking whatsoever from its original release. Which is why in the base Origins CD, the drop dash was the same as in Mania. So in summary, the drop dash was never broken. It just followed the rules put in place by each game they added it to. Though none of that really matters now, as version 2.0 removes that pesky roll lock altogether. Now Sonic 1 and 2 can drop dash as fluidly as in Mania, CD, and 3. But I want to make clear this isn't added specifically to the drop dash. See, a normal roll or a spin dash roll is also without the roll lock, meaning even Tails and Knuckles can switch directions at will, despite not being able to use a drop dash. And if you look closely at Tails, you see his body switching sides, though his two tails still follow behind. Sorry for the long explanation, but I just find it fascinating that the physics of the older games were altered in a way that would probably go unnoticed or unchanged 
if it weren't for the drop dash ability. Though while we're on the topic, I guess I should note that the Sega Ages releases do add in the drop dash, and it can even change directions, but the roll lock is not removed altogether. Okay, that's one change out of the way for Sonic 1 and 2, but also in 2, we'll see that by playing as Knuckles, the X screen is now green. This is to match the original lock-on game, Knuckles and Sonic 2, where the screen is green to set it apart from Sonic and Tails' blue screen. The base Sonic Origins had all three set to blue, but Nux gets his cool green hue back. It would be interesting to see Tails given his own screen, but I'm sure he's fine with blue for tradition's sake. Jumping into Sonic CD, we'll catch a glimpse of something that I'll discuss later. And over in Sonic 3, we have a very minor change that I'm not exactly sure why they added. This little bridge piece in Hydro City Act 2 was never there in Sonic 3 or 3 and Knuckles, and it wasn't even there in the base Sonic Origins. My initial guess was maybe it's to avoid being crushed there by the wall, but it would be more work to actually get that to happen than it just occurring by chance. Not to mention, you'll respawn here as many times as needed, even without that save point 10 feet into the act. But that's all for 2.0 changes, apart from this prompt urging us to get the plus DLC. So let's go input our 16 digit code. Loading back in, the most obvious change will be the plus now on the logo. But if we look beyond that, we'll see that our island cams have gotten a bit more inhabited. Knuckles and Amy have finally come out to play. I'm guessing these are their Sonic Superstars models, so it's an easy inclusion. Where the rest of it is probably composed of Sonic Generations assets, notably Sonic, Tails, and Eggman, though I couldn't say for sure. But their inclusions make the menu more fun. Knuckles can be seen gliding by, and even climbing at times. And Amy poses with her Pico Hammer in hand. Though I guess we should follow her on our adventures. Having Amy Rose being playable is really exciting, as she didn't get to shine much in the classic games. She's of course in her Rosie the Rascal outfit that she donned in those early days. And she brought along her hammer that was first featured in Sonic Fighters. There's no better place to start than Sonic 1, so here we'll try out her moves. So Amy has the standard moves you'll expect from any character, the spin jump and the spin dash. But if you press the button twice, you'll get the hammer spin. It gives your attack some extra range, like the insta shield, though it differs in that there's no invincibility frames. It also can't be used to deflect projectiles. You get a cool little sound effect when bopping an enemy, and you can even bounce from one enemy to another. If you jump and hold the button, you get the hammer dash, where Amy swings the hammer in a fury for a short sprint, mowing down anything in her path before running normal again. This is performed like a drop dash and feels pretty similar, just a bit slower. And it can be used to go up slopes or around loops. If you cancel out of this attack or change directions during, Amy will instead go into an instant sprint without needing to build momentum. And it should be noted that her hammer only activates with a jump, so there's no stationary hammer hits. If we stand in place long enough, we see her waiting animation. But let's put those moves to use and reach the end of the act. Here, we see that Amy gets her own sign. Jumping into that big ring will have the special stages function the same as with any character. And you can expect the good and bad endings to offer the same, though it's cool to see it this time around as Amy. Here's her ending pose, complete with the hammer. And where Knuckles and Tails had very slight changes to the credit clips, 
Amy is the same as Sonic's, not even swinging once. Back at the title screen, you may remember seeing variations for Tails, Knuckles, and Sonic and Tails, but unfortunately, there is no title screen variation for Amy. And where the demos were updated before to include Tails and Knuckles, there's no such update for Amy. In the cheat menu, we can add Tails to an Amy run, like we can with Sonic. And you'll see that the ending follows the Sonic and Tails scene, only with Amy replacing Sonic. But the strange thing is, the naming logo says Sonic and Tails, so only Amy's solo run replaces this for her. I'll also note that this plus update still hasn't added a Sonic Tails mode outside of the cheat menu, despite the mobile release having this option officially. But now that all of our characters are accounted for, let's switch back to Amy and jump into Sonic CD. Things have come full circle. Amy is now playable in her debut game. And our intro movie fits well for this playthrough. So just like Knuckles and Tails, Amy's abilities are consistent throughout the whole collection, so we won't have to go over any more moves. To the end of the act, there obviously can't be an Amy Rose waiting up for us. So let's jump into the ring. Here's Amy's sprites in the pseudo 3D UFO chase. And further on, we reach Collision Chaos Act 1. This is the point of the game where Amy originally gets kidnapped. So what will happen now? Oh, nothing. That's fine for a Tails playthrough, but since this is Amy's game, it would have been nice if they added a little something extra here. Maybe a small scene where Metal Sonic tries to capture Amy, but she fends him off with her hammer and the game can continue normal from there. But don't worry, we'll get our revenge. Speeding along to start a speedway, we can finally meet the Metal Hedgehog. And Amy gets to dash along, putting him in his place. Oh yeah, payback time. Moving along, we take down Eggman, and once again, the accompanying animation fits well with our playthrough. Well, assuming Sonic was there at the ending. But that's really it for Amy CD. But before moving on, we'll give her a break and check out Knuckles' playthrough. So the base version of Sonic Origins had Knuckles playable in only three out of the four games, leaving him out of Sonic CD, which felt like a huge oversight. Well, thankfully, that has now been rectified and our favorite echidna can glide along in Palm Tree Panic. You can actually climb up this huge wall you're meant to run up, and even drop down to a spot that's inaccessible with the other characters. We'll call it the Knuckles Lounge. But speaking of secret spots, we can go underground to find our first new route. That's right, just like how the remasters added fly routes to Sonic 1 and 2, Sonic CD now has these short, alternate paths. That's pretty cool that they added these. It once again sets a Knuckles playthrough apart from the others. But I wanted to see if these routes were exclusive or not. So jumping back in as Sonic, we can drop down and see that the new route is still there. Just, we'll have a bit of trouble accessing it. Though Tails, of course, can move along unhindered by the height. And I didn't notice this until I later went back to check, but the new route is even in the 2.0 version without the plus expansion. But moving along as Knuckles, I wanted to find more routes. So I pulled up some old level maps and looked for any gaps in the layout where a new path could be added. So I found this one floating in the air in the middle of Collision Chaos. One hidden in this rightmost wall in Tidal Tempest. Right above the start and to the left in Wacky Workbench. And my favorite, and one you don't even have to search for, the very start of Metallic Madness 
where Knuckles begins the act in his very own starting location. Now I only really searched the first act of each, and didn't spend much time in the past or futures, so there's probably some other secret routes left to seek out. Let me know if you find any. But sticking to the main course, there's a couple of things to look at. Here, we see Knuckles crash through the wall. Each character leaves a different hole, so here's all four. And each character also has a chibi sprite, so here's each. I think Knuckles looks the funniest. Here's his Pseudo 3D Special Stage Sprites. And I like how the fan puts them in a glide. And finally, here's his Metal Sonic Race, where the glide can be quite useful if used in just the right spot. Let's go forth to the ending, where, well, there isn't really one. See, Sonic CD relied on the FMV for its closing, which is actually an awesome way to end things considering Sonic was originally the only playable character. That same ending works fine for Amy since, well, she's in it, but that leaves Tails and Knuckles without any satisfying send-off of their own. Oh well, see you next game. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 Let's continue our run as Amy. Oh wow, and I thought this was bad before. As you can see, we can choose Amy with Tails. You know, this really brings me back to Sonic Advance 3. Anyway, Tails can fly us around, taking Amy to new heights. But I think we'll continue on solo from here, so we're not given that Tails tax in the special stages. Here you can see Amy's new special stage sprites. And the emblem behind the thumbs up is pink just for her. This follows the color-coded trend seen with the other characters. Blue, orange, and red for Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, respectively. Getting through all of the stages will give us that 7th Chaos Emerald. And back at the level? Well, we might as well give it a try. Aw oh, yeah! Amy is now given a super form. This is huge. For as long as she's been in the series, she's not once had the opportunity to transform. This also does away with one of the dumbest concepts introduced to the Sonic lore. That being the alleged idea that only male hedgehogs can go super. Good on you, Amy, for breaking the mold. So along with the extra speed and invincibility, Super Amy will flash between pink and white. I think this color really suits her. Performing a hammer dash will make the whole screen shake. So playing as Amy with a super form is a lot of fun, but you just know I had to test something. So I replayed all seven special stages as our favorite Fox Tales. My thinking here was since the Sonic 3 remaster was done new for 2022, they had nothing against adding a base emerald super form for Tails. And since the Sonic 2 remaster was done back in 2013, they just didn't bother adding much to it. But for an Origins Plus update that adds in another character, maybe they'd just go ahead and activate the Super Fox? No, didn't happen. This is Tails' breakout game, and he still can't shine with a super form, but two foreign characters can. Look, I know there's some discussion about this being some lore detail, and I'm not about to go into that much, because I already did it here. But I still haven't found any actual sources to back this up, and this supposed story element isn't ever displayed in the game, or even in the manuals. Origins has the base super form already in 3, and Sonic 2 takes place not long before it. How much experience could Tails really gain between Final Fortress Zone and Hydro City? Besides, let's not pretend that lore details really matter in this collection. Otherwise, Amy wouldn't even be here at all.
But Amy is here, and that's all that matters. Bringing her to Casino Night will have Sonic's Rio replaced, just the same as it does for Knuckles. And at the end of Aquatic Ruin, we have a Hammer vs. Hammer showdown. Here's Amy in Hidden Palace. And then onward to the ending. Interestingly, even though we collected all of the emeralds, and even went super, her ending sprite doesn't glow like it does for Sonic and Knuckles. Going to the stretched out competition mode, we see Amy has been added there too. And since Amy and Tails have gotten acquainted, let's fly into Angel Island for Amy in Sonic 3. So Amy's intro will be pretty much the same as Tails. Only difference is, Amy will crouch on the plane, and she'll jump off instead, leaving him behind. Or if you chose an Amy and Tails run, you'll both run off together. Amy's moves will of course be the same again, but there's one weird exception. When doing a hammer dash at one of these loops, Amy will no longer be able to go around. I'm guessing this isn't intentional, but it does seem like a big oversight. When I got to Tails' spike bed, I just then realized the two are the same height. And since Amy can swing her hammer in the air, it's worth mentioning that she can't smash down Knuckles' boulders. Though she can break other barriers, like these pillars you'd normally need to raise the ground to get through. After defeating our mini-boss, you can see Amy strike a victory pose. And while that sign is spinning, you can catch a glimmer of pink. That is of course for Amy's act clear sign. But it's interesting to note, you can see it even when not playing as Amy. Sonic could always see everyone's sign within Origins, but Tails and Knuckles could only see each other's, not Sonic's. So it's interesting to see Amy's sign added while Sonic's still absent. Hydro City presents our first opportunity to collect all seven emeralds. Here's another look at some special stage sprites. And once going super, you can see that the ground doesn't shake like it does in Sonic 2. Strange. Maybe they're saving that little effect for the hyperform? The bonus stage has the reel switched out, just like with Casino Night. And here's the point where I first noticed that bridge piece in Act 2, before going back to check the older version. This watery level transition works fine, and Amy of course takes on the same boss as Sonic and Tails. But despite already linking up with him, Tails won't bother delivering Amy to Carnival Night. She just shows up here instead. The same thing can be said for the Mushroom Hill transition. Even if you chose to play with Tails following you, you both just appear. This is strange, because this transition works with Solo Sonic, Solo Tails, and of course, the Sonic and Tails team. All other transitions seem to work fine though. But since we're now in the and Knuckles half of the game, Let's trade in our emeralds. Upon collecting our seventh super emerald, we get a little message. Amy can now be super Amy. Uh, just super? Shouldn't it say hyper Amy? So when transforming now, she'll look exactly the same as before, as there's no after images trailing behind us like with the other hyper forms. So it's this? plus the Super Amy wording that initially led me to believe there is no second transformation for Amy, which was pretty disappointing. But it turns out there is one new trick up her sleeve, and that's this hammer throw, exclusive to what would be her hyper form. That's kind of a shame we don't get a true hyper Amy, but at least we can bring her into the doomsday zone in debug mode complete with the flying hammers. Though funny enough, she's seen just running through space. In the actual Amy ending, 
we'll see she pretty much follows Sonic's ending. And we do see her flashing super before Tails catches her. And unlike in Sonic 2, her ending pose does sport the super effects. Here, we see that Amy is added to the ending logo. And the game clear image has been replaced to now include her. It should be noted that Origins Plus doesn't add any more save slots, so you may need to delete a couple depending on how many times you've played through the base version. But of course on the screen we can see a solo Amy slot and an Amy and Tails slot. Jumping into competition mode, we see that Amy is added here as well. And just like Knuckles' Glide and Sonic's Drop Dash, Amy's Hammer Dash is taken out here. At least if you don't use that secret code. Though her acceleration is increased here in exchange for slightly less control. And finally, we can continue to get our special stage fix as Amy in New Blue Sphere. The Pink Star Sphere is the selection for her, and if we look at the original Get Blue Spheres, we see it hasn't been altered to include her. But once again, with Blue Sphere out of the way, that concludes our time with Sonic 3 and brings us into some of the extra features in Sonic Origins. So let's check out if anything's changed for our Pink Hedgehog. I wanted to check first with Mission Mode, and unfortunately, there's nothing new here. That's a missed opportunity, considering there's quite a few challenges based around Tails and Knuckles' unique abilities, and I'd like to see the same for Amy. I could picture one where you have to get a certain number of bounces off of enemies' heads without touching the ground, or striking down bad nicks using only the hammer dash. Maybe even put that hammer toss to use. The museum also doesn't add anything new, so any coins you've collected in your runs as Amy aren't really utilized much. Mirror mode will give you exactly as you expect, Amy but to the left. And Amy can also partake in boss rush mode. Playing this mode really highlights how many of Amy's boss battles can be cheesed with the extended reach. There's also been Sonic CD style life icons added in the CD section for Amy and Knuckles. You won't see these in the main game since Origins replaces it with a coin icon. Sonic's head was the original and is still present in classic mode. And Tails got his own for the 2011 version which was later brought over for Boss Rush. And finally we'll look to the past and test out classic mode. Obviously Amy won't be in here, right? She was never playable in these games before. Well, bringing up level select does indeed allow us to bring Amy into classic mode. Interestingly, she is given a life icon here, though that's also present for the boss mode, so it makes sense. That added bridge piece is in classic mode now. But the alternate routes in Sonic CD are absent, which is interesting since the added routes in Sonic 1 and 2 are present in Classic. Also, the update to Sonic's movement in Sonic 1 and 2 is carried over to Classic mode despite the drop dash not being present here. And Amy's hammer dash is gone too, though I'm not sure if that was an intentional decision or an indication that that move is built on top of Sonic's drop dash. Anyway, all of these changes bring classic mode even further from staying true to the original games. Which is odd considering Origins Plus makes it clear they're not opposed to using emulation within the collection. Actually, let's talk about that. Sonic Origins Plus adds 12 games to be played through. These used to be given a good amount of attention in past collections, but were forgotten about for some time. So I'm happy to see they're being recognized once again. I'll start by doing a short overview of each game, then we'll come back to discuss their inclusion overall. 
Sonic 1 8-bit. It calls it a port of Sonic 1, but I don't think that's accurate. To me, it's a completely different game. Sure, it shares its name and story with the Genesis debut, and features three of the same zone themes, but the layouts are completely different, and the remaining three zones are unique to this game. It stands on its own as a solid entry in the series, despite the weaker hardware. In fact, that may even contribute to the charm. I've always been fond of Bridge Zone and the Jungle. Sonic 2 8-Bit This one differs completely from its Genesis counterpart. None of the zone themes are shared. Sonic can't spin dash or go super. And most importantly, Tails doesn't join you, instead being kidnapped in the intro. Though, he's somehow still featured in the title cards. The game starts you out in a dreary cave, which is not the usual for this series. But it quickly opens up, having us paragliding over clouds, bouncing over the surface of a lake, and running through a crystal palace with a familiar face in the structures. Sonic Chaos is the third game in the 8-bit series, this time having a wholly original title. It is also known as Sonic and Tails, and as you can see, Tails is playable this time. He can fly, but it's done a bit differently than you may expect. Sonic, of course, will be our main playthrough, and he's got his spin dash this time, as well as the super peel out, or a strike dash. This game's much easier than the previous two, and strangely, only contains five of the Chaos Emeralds. Triple Trouble is next, the sequel to Sonic Chaos, also having the name Sonic and Tails 2. This one is the most going for it out of all of the 8-bit games, having the most complex levels, Tails playthrough being equal to Sonic's, and featuring a triple threat of villains with appearances from Knuckles, Knack the Weasel, and Metal Sonic. And of course, the Mad Doctor is behind it all. The fifth and final game in the 8-bit side-scrolling series is Sonic Blast. Not to be confused with Sonic 3D Blast, though they released at about the same time. This game features both Sonic and Knuckles as playable characters, as they run through five zones in pre-rendered 8-bit visuals. I think the game looks really cool. Well, all except for the most important element, that being the character sprites looking kind of jake. The gameplay is a step back from Triple Trouble, though I do like Sonic's double jump ability. Though Knuckles' glide is just a bit too shallow to be very useful. With the side-scrollers done, we still have seven games to cover. So next up, we have the 8-bit rendition of Sonic Spinball. It's a fairly accurate port, though there are various differences, such as there being no slime barrel canoeing, no roller coaster minecarts, and most of all, no robotic sea serpent. The bosses and bonus stages also have some differences. But despite all of this, the zone themes and much of their design are in line with the 16-bit game. Mean Bean Machine is our other port, playing mostly the same as its 16-bit counterpart. The visuals are simplified, of course, and the badniks don't get to do their little monologues. But our cast of rivals are exactly the same. I always love that Scratch, Grounder, and Coconuts were featured in the game. There is one little bonus exclusive to the 8-bit version, and that's Puzzle Mode, where you're given specific tasks to complete within the bean board. Next up, Tails flies in for two solo games, and Sky Patrol is his first. With the power of the boomerang and plenty of mint candies, Tails chases after Witch Cart Yes, a witch in a cart, to take her down along with her minions. 
There's five auto-scrolling levels where you'll be dodging or shooting everything in your path. Tails Adventure is his other solo outing, this one acting as a sort of prequel to Sonic 2, taking place before Tails and Sonic met. His home is threatened by a fleet of militarized birds, so Tails uses his smarts to fight back with an assortment of gadgets. The game is a decent length as Tails explores all of Coco Island, and although it takes a much different approach than other Sonic titles, I think it's a good fit for Tails, utilizing both his tinkering skills and his flight in creative ways. Sonic Drift is Sonic's first racing game, kicking off the sub-series of Sonic racing in a car instead of on foot, even though we all know running would be faster. We have four characters to choose from, Sonic and Tails are to be expected, but Amy appears for a first time as a playable character. Also, our nemesis Dr. Eggman is playable, which is pretty neat if you ask me. We have six zones to speed through, all of which you'll recognize from the first game, each having three variations across the green, yellow, and red Grand Prix. Sonic Drift 2 steps things up a little, adding three additional characters, Metal Sonic, Knuckles, and Knack the Weasel, er, the uh, Fang the Sniper. There's three Grand Prix again, representing the purple, white, and blue emeralds, and this time, there's far less repeated tracks. You'll recognize quite a few from Sonic 2, one from Sonic 3, and even some original zones here and there. This one feels a bit more difficult than the last, but in exchange, we can now store items and use them as we please. Okay, last and, well, possibly least, we have Sonic Labyrinth. Not to be confused with Labyrinth Zone, but to many, probably brings up a similar sense of dread. This game slows things down a bit, giving Sonic slow shoes, so our solution is to spin dash our way around. This turns Sonic yet again into a sort of pinball, so we have to pay mind to our charge speed and the course around us to avoid obstacles. We have to collect keys to move forward, and this is done in a way that really resembles Sonic 3D Blast. Now you may have noticed I made it a point to call these 8-bit games and not Game Gear games, and that's because not all of these games shown are exclusive to the Game Gear. Origins did use only the Game Gear versions, but I think it would have been a lot better had they used the Master System versions where applicable. See, the two versions of each game are almost identical in design but the one big difference is how much is displayed on the screen. The Master System has a resolution of 256 by 192 pixels, where the Game Gear only has 160 by 144. This means that any Game Gear game is cropped considerably compared to its Master System counterpart, and it's strange to me that they'd choose the 8-bit versions where you see less since one of the biggest draws to the Genesis remasters was the extended view in widescreen. That just means if you want the best versions available, you'll have to look elsewhere than Sonic Origins. Here's a graphic I made for my collections video, ironically about the inclusion of the 8-bit games within Origins, and you can see that half of the games are available on the SMS. There's also been conversions made by fans, which shows that Sega could do the same to give us even better official versions. But if nothing else, why not just include both versions where possible? I'm sure they could spare the extra 3 megabytes. But even if they insist on using the Game Gear versions, there's no options for scan lines, pixel smoothing, or any other screen settings I never bother to use. You just can't beat clean, sharp pixels. 
Though I will say, everything else aside, they could have used more screen real estate. You of course have the pillar boxes on the sides, but then there's a thick black border around the game as well. So here's the Origins Pitmaster boss, and here's how it could be in an ideal collection. But all visuals aside, you do have one emulation feature that is handy. A save state and load state, so you can leave and pick up at any point. Though there's only one slot for each game, I would have liked to see at least two for the games with multiple playable characters. There's also no fast forward or rewind functions like in the Genesis collection, so that would be a helpful addition. Only other thing I really have to say is the start button is mapped to X, which isn't a problem, but it may have you accidentally bringing up the menu a few times before you're used to it. But with these 12 games out of the way, let's look into Origin Plus's final surprise. Clicking on Surprise will display a blank picture that's put together in pieces by completing very easy, yet plus exclusive actions. I got all but one of these just by playing normally, but the final action leads me into another criticism. We have to bring Amy or Knuckles to the statue and wacky workbench, which is fine as it is, it's easy to do if you know where to look but I already cleared the game as both Amy and Knuckles, and the way Origins handles game clears, you can't go back to a prior act like in Sonic 3 or Mania. There's also no no save mode, so why not use level select? Well there's no title screen code implemented into Origins Sonic CD, unlike the three other games. And if you go through the work to unlock level select, it only works for Sonic. Time Attack mode also only works for Sonic, despite three other characters now being playable. Look, there is an easy solution for this, I just wanted to highlight how weird it is not to have a consistent level select across all four games, with character selection as well. Sonic CD is again the odd one out. But if you do want to get to Wacky Workbench, or any other zone from any game, just visit the Data and Rankings menu. Now, you won't be able to choose between a good or bad future, and there's no way to continue from one act to the next, but it does good enough for what we're trying to achieve. With the egg statue destroyed, we can see that celebratory image in full. It's a nice little illustration, if not the most surprising surprise. And the reward for doing this is a cheat code section added to the tutorials in the options menu. Ironic, as we were just discussing this, and no, this wasn't planned this way for the script. Though it is funny to me to see Sonic 1, 2, and 3's codes displayed plainly, and Sonic CD has this convoluted way of doing it. Someone had to write all of this, and they didn't think that maybe they should just add in a code? It's also funny it says cheat codes, but only gives each game's level select. This could have been a nice little index of all the other codes, like debug mode, super forms, or all of the crazy codes added to Sonic 3. But that closes us out on all of the new features added in Sonic Origins Plus. A lot of it was cool to see, but there is of course more that I would have liked to see added. I cover all of that in the Plus Speculation section of my Origins video, so there's not much sense in repeating it all here, but I will say a few things. A Life's Toggle for Anniversary Mode would be a good addition, and it seems like it would be a no-brainer considering the mobile releases had lives. I just think it's not too much of a stretch to think someone would want to play in widescreen and with limited tries. Another potential option could be music related. Now I know some clever rascals are probably asking if Origins Plus 
fixes the Sonic 3 music by adding back the Jackson tracks. But we all know that's not a possibility. But having the option to switch to the actual prototype tracks would be nice considering they're already out there, and many had complaints with the Origins versions. Amy's hammer ability could use a slight tweak. If you attack one of these spiked poindexters, the hit will transfer through the hammer and hurt Amy, which I'm guessing it's not meant to be an extension of her mortal self. Her boss battles could also use slight tweaks for more of an equal challenge. But besides Amy, one more character would have made this add-on that much more enticing. Mania Plus added two completely unique characters to that game, so adding another to Origins would be fitting. And no, I don't count Knuckles in CD, since he should have been there from the start. Metal Sonic would be the best choice here. I get that Sega maybe wouldn't want us playing as the enemy, and you'd have to work out how to do the boss fights, but playing as Sonic's robotic nemesis isn't something completely unheard of in the series. And it would give each of these games even more replayability. Or how about another mode? Challenge mode, boss rush, and mirror mode are great to play these games in another way. But for Plus specifically, there's nothing extra in the way of modes, like with Mania's Encore mode. But at the end of it, this is the plus add-on we received, and I suppose it does just fine. I don't foresee any more major updates coming to the game, and I did get a lot out of it with each of the playthroughs available. I'm just hoping that now that the classics have been redone, and the 8-bits have been acknowledged, we can move our way up the series and get remastered versions of the Sonic Advance games, and hopefully they take all the time necessary to get it right. At least we have a brand new classic game on the way, and it will be interesting to see how Superstars is handled following the work on Origins and Origins Plus. But I think that's all I've got to say. Thanks for returning for this Plus update, and I'll see you in whatever's next.